Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome to the American Academy of Emergency Medicine Women and Emergency Medicine Section's virtual mentoring session for osteopathic medical students. My name is Anantha Singaraj, and I'll be moderating tonight's session. I'm going to go ahead and stop my screen share. Perfect. And feel free to turn on your cameras and interact with all of us. Um, I know that today's session is about crushing interviews, so we can go ahead and give you feedback on your Zoom appearance as well. And um, today's session will be recorded and will be uploaded to AEM's uh, Women in Emergency Medicine's website within 24 hours if you want to go back and look at it. Today's session is meant to be interactive, so please use the Q&A if you'd like to ask a question or comment. We welcome and encourage your participation. Uh, a ton of you have also submitted questions and we'll be addressing that as well. We're a very friendly group and look forward to getting to know each other better tonight. And uh, feel free to also uh, introduce yourself in the chat box. Tell us uh, where you're from, what school you're coming from, or your biggest fear of interviewing. And today I have the privilege of introducing you to our panelists. Panelists, as I introduce you, just kind of give a wave so that they know who you are. So first up, we have Angie Carrick, who's the Associate Dean of Preclinical Education at Kansas College of Osteopathic Medicine. Dr. Carrick is an Associate Dean at a newly developing medical school in Wichita, Kansas. I am, um, she's the former associate program director for five years at Norman Regional Hospital EM residency, um, wellness proponent, mom of three young boys, wife, passionate vegan and animal activist and foodie. Next, we have Alika Glor Fernandez. Uh, she's a PG1 at Emory University Emergency Medicine. Uh, she attended medical school at Kansas City University. She's passionate about mentoring EM bound medical students, particularly those who attend osteopathic medical schools. In her free time, you can probably find her whipping up a feast from scratch or at a brewery with her husband and Golden Doodle Gambino. Next, we have Dr. Deborah Pierce. Can't tell if you waved Dr. Pierce, you're off of my screen, but um, she is the program director at Einstein for the past five years did residency at Einstein, then worked at Cooper for seven years at, as APD, then back to Einstein, left to work in the community for a few years, then back to Einstein as APD and now PD. Just completed two years as medical staff president, now chair of credentials committee outside work. She has two daughters, both in college and loves to play tennis. And last but not least, we have Dr. Leanne Shalabi. Uh, she is a first year resident at University of Illinois, Chicago. She attended medical school at Chicago College of Osteopathic Medicine. In her free time, you can find her cheering for the Chicago Bears and spending time with her family and friends. Panelists, the floor is yours. Um, we'll start off with Dr. Carrick. Uh, tonight's topic is about crushing interviews. So Dr. Carrick, what advice do you have for the medical students? Hello, everybody. It's great to be here. I'm glad you all are here. Please feel free to um, pop your video on. We would love to see your faces. It's almost like um, more like being in person if we can see who you are. Um, but if you don't want to, that's that's completely fine. No big deal. So let's see my advice. I was thinking about this and I will tell you, I just finished um, five years straight of going through a lot of interviews with potential residency candidates. So there were some things that always were my pet peeves. Maybe I should start with that. Things that you should, that, that always kind of, I, I thought were, were everybody did. It doesn't make you stand out. And um, uh, so one of those things is I, I feel like People come into the interview expecting to just sit down and have a conversation and that it will all flow naturally. You don't need to actually practice it, that you don't actually have to prepare, which is not true. Okay, so my first word of advice would be to um, find, uh, and I have a list of questions I would be happy to share with you, but Ask any, anybody you know, get on the internet and what are the, you know, Google, what are the most commonly asked uh, interview questions type of thing. But, but just write, the, write little notes. It doesn't have to be rehearsed completely or memorized, but actually think about some answers about yourself, your strengths, your weaknesses. Why do you want to come to this program? Whatever it is and think about it before you go to the interview. Because I feel like many people do not have answers to questions that are 
very, very common interview questions and they get hung up and, and it, it makes you appear unprepared. Um, my other big thing is try to think of maybe some unique answers other than your characteristic of I'm a hard worker. We know that if you're in medical school, you are a hard worker. Everybody is a hard worker. That is not why you will be selected to go to a residency program because we assume you will work hard. So think of other reasons that you stand out to a program, whatever makes you unique and uh, reasons that a program should select you. And then, you know, practice um, with a friend or family uh, so that you get comfortable with, um, so most interviews are, as I assume, going to be on Zoom. So I would say practice so that you know that things are going to work and that you know where to focus your attention, like look at your camera so that your eyes are straightforward instead of looking down or up or to the side. So. I would say prepare, practice, and please don't say you're hardworking. <laughs> those are those are my things to start off with. And Dr. Pierce, would you like to uh, talk next about Zoom etiquette and your backgrounds and just all the good stories you have for us? And you're muted. <laughs> oh, there we I go. have. I have to tell you, I've probably done 500 Zoom interviews between interviewing and everything, and I just didn't unmute. And it, for what it's worth, we all do that. And we, I probably hear three times a day, I can't believe I've been doing this for a year and a half, and I still screw up share screen or I still whatever. So people who are doing it all the time say that. So don't panic. Don't like feel like oh my gosh, I'm not comfortable with the Zoom. I haven't done this before. I haven't done whatever. You know, we all, you'll be fine. Um, last year when we were figuring out the Zoom interviews, we, none of us kind of knew what to expect and we were all a little apprehensive and it honestly worked out pretty fine. Um, I felt like you can get a decent feel for people over Zoom. Is it as great as being in person? Of course not, but it is not, purposeless. You can absolutely, you will get a feel for who we are and we'll get a feel for who you are. That's, that's pretty good. And, um, and I think that our interns, we have 15 in our class of, of interns and they all have said that they feel like they really made a very good choice. And, um, you know, they, many of them did not see our place before they came to us. So, so you will figure this out. You will, it will work for you. You'll figure out the right place for you to be. You will get vibes one way or another. Um, the process will work for you. It, it really works pretty well. So I will, um, can I give my one word of, of advice first and then talk about Zoom backgrounds? Absolutely. So, so uh, all the things people say, the be yourself, be honest, um, that's all 100% correct. You can just be yourself, be professional, don't slouch, don't like, you know, don't be overly casual, be professional, but be yourself and, um, and be honest, and that'll present you the best way possible. And then um, other things that are obvious, and then I'm going to tell you my number one thing, but um, be on time. I had, we did, um, we try to interview our medical students. We do it kind of as a, as a educational thing with our rotations while they're with us. And I had one of them came onto Zoom. He was late or he was at the very last minute, came into Zoom and his camera was on and he was tying his tie. And that is, don't do that. That is poor attention to detail. It is being late. It, it just don't do that. Do whatever you need to do to be five minutes early and to be um, prepared when you get onto Zoom. I think that one of the, the best thing you can probably say during your interviews and that you would have, um, you would tell me about 
is why you are special for Einstein or for wherever. What makes you uniquely special for my program? Know enough about the programs that you're interviewing with and most importantly, the patients that they see at those institutions to know why you would wanna go there. So many of us, maybe not all of us, but many of us are really, really, really um, concerned and protective of our patients. And, you know, my mission is to serve the patients of North Philadelphia where Einstein is, and um, obviously to teach residents and all that kind of stuff. But I want to have residents that are going to treat my patients well. And they're going to be our patients and who's going to treat our patients well. So for me, I, I'm in an underserved, very, um, very poor community. And I want to hear something from you that tells me that you want to treat patients. They're very diverse. They're very, you know, it's all sorts of different ethnicities and different languages. You know, why do you want to be in North Philadelphia? And I, I would encourage you to try to convince um, the people you're interviewing with why you would be special and why you want to be at their program. Um, that's probably my number one. All right, so here's the funny stories. So backgrounds, you have to pay attention to your Zoom background. So make a Zoom call, put yourself on Zoom if you haven't done it, wherever you're going to interview, and you don't even have to have anybody on the other side. You can just see what your picture looks like when it comes up for the Zoom. So get on a Zoom meeting and look at what you look like. So think about things behind you that may make you look weird and try not to do that because we're seeing it and, and you don't want us to be thinking, oh my gosh, they have a plant growing out of their head. You want us to be looking at your face, looking at your eyes and talking to you. Um, you don't want to have me, I had the other day, one of my, my students had a light coming in from the window that was casting, somehow was reflecting and causing her to look like she had half of a face. It was so bizarre, but it completely made it so you couldn't see half of her face. And I was sitting there trying to figure out how this phenomenon was happening, as opposed to talking to her and listening to what she was saying. You don't want to do that. You know, I told her at the end of the interview, you need to tilt your computer one way or the other so that that window isn't, or put shades down or whatever. Um, what is behind you on your bookshelf? So one of my um, co-attendings who is really attentive to detail, when we were debriefing after an interview last year, she said, did you guys notice the books on the bookshelf? And I'm like, not really. I wasn't looking at the books. I was talking to the person. and um, the, she said he had three ortho books on his bookshelf and no emergency medicine books. He doesn't want to do emergency medicine. He wants to do ortho. And I was like, oh, good pickup. Um, but be careful what kind of books. And we had another person who had a book that had some like offensive curse words. And even if it's a funny book, even if it's like the, I won't say some of the names of the funny books, but even if it don't have anything that anybody could misinterpret or anybody could could not like. Um, I had during one of the interviews, a person's cat came into their room and jumped on top of their head and was sitting on top of their head while they were trying to interview with me. Don't do that. Don't it, do whatever you have to do to keep your animals away. If you have animals that aren't gonna stay out of your room, go to Starbucks and do your interview from Starbucks or go to school or to your rotation. And I've had students ask me if they could have a room in our offices to do interviews. Ask away and go do that. Don't have barking dogs in the background. Don't have cats. It is not endearing during your interview to have your cat up crawling on your shoulders. It's not, it's fine if I'm talking to you one-on-one -on -one, and we're just chatting, but in that interview, you have to be professional and that's not okay. Um, and then the other thing is to dress professionally. So I had one of our students last year, one of the students that rotated with us to our interview wore a t-shirt 
And, um, you know, I said to her at the end of the interview, I just have to tell you because you're one of mine, you're one of our students, you can't wear a t-shirt, you have to wear a suit. Put on something professional on your top. If you want to wear sweatpants or pajama pants on your bottom, nobody will see, but don't stand up. And then um, make sure you're professional. And I'll just add that she's one of our interns now. So um, I, I don't judge, but you want to make sure that you are professional. So those are just some of the funny stories and I probably could go on, but I'll pass it on to somebody else. All right, and with that, uh, Dr. Shalabi, can you continue with uh, the lighting setup? Uh, maybe share some of the pictures that you were showing me. Uh, we had a student ask, uh, how much more lighting does he need? Does he need to invest, invest in a ring light? Does he need to invest in a camera and a stand or is his laptop camera okay? And then also kind of give us your one piece of advice if you can give anything. Yeah, okay. So um, first time here um, doing one of these panelist things, but I wanted to kind of just show what my interview set up. Um, I gave away my stuff to uh, one of my friends who's interviewing right now. Um, so my interview setup is less than ideal. I have lights popping out of my head, so would not recommend that, but you don't need to um, buy like a webcam or anything. I ended up buying one um, just since I, I kind of reasoned that I wasn't going to be spending money on flights, um, so I might as well just invest on having a good camera. Um, it was like $60 at Target, but again, I have so many of my friends who just use their laptop cameras and they had successful interview seasons. Um, I will show you my, um, the setup really quick, oops. And mine was a little bit more intense than other people's, I'm sure. I was interviewing at my boyfriend's apartment because I was living at home during my fourth year of med school and didn't really want my mom listening in in the background. Um, so on the left, it's what people would look at to see what, um, you know, just like how, yeah, for like programs to see what I would look like on the interview. And then the right was just the setup. I had two ring lights. I bought the smaller one the first time around and I was like, this is not enough light for a ground floor apartment. And so I bought the second one because the lighting was just not ideal. Um, but yeah, so those are just some things that I had. And then I also wanted to just also bring up to, if you are at home or if you're worried about background noises, I use this app, I'll put it in the chat. It's called Crisp and so it's with the K. Um, it will mute all of the, it's kind of like a noise cancellation headphones, but just for your laptop. Um, and it worked pretty, like, pretty good for me. Um, and then a piece of advice for people who are applying, I would go to all of the Zoom events that the programs are hosting, um, the pre-interview dinners that the residents would have um, normally there the night before the interview. And I just thought it was a good way of just seeing how the residents interacted, you know, if they were kind of more hanging out together versus a little bit more formal kind of spoke to me about like what type of program um, it was. And if the residents, you know, were more familial and had more time outside of the hospital um, for hanging out and all that kind of stuff. So, which that was something that was important to me. So definitely got like a good feel of the program, even not on interview day, but yeah, the go to as many, even if you're feeling super zoomed out, but. Leanne, can I ask you a question? Because yeah, I was on the other side of it and um, my yeah. program, we were, um, we were, I would say a smaller size program, community hospital, only residency in the hospital. Um, and during the pandemic, we had to not do our dinners that we normally did the night before. So um, what, what would your feeling be on programs, you know, that couldn't do something like that versus, I mean, how can you get a feel? Do you have a, a, a preference or like a way to, how would you deal with that if the program didn't, do you have advice for them? Since that was something. Yeah, so we didn't. Oh, sorry, have. go on. <laughs> no, oh, that, that's okay. Yeah, we didn't have that. So I didn't even think about that as something that other programs may be doing, which is a great idea. Yeah, I actually didn't go to any of the, like there was no formal in-person pre-interview dinners with any of the programs. Um, everything was completely done through Zoom. 
Um, and so all of the residents also were in their own separate homes, socially distancing. Um, some programs, some of the residents were together, but it wasn't like a sense of just, or I guess if they did have a pre-interview dinner and it was virtual interview dinner, um, even if the residents were separated and there was just a bunch of screens going on, um, I, I kind of just looked to see how everyone was interacting with each other too. Cause as an applicant, you kind of just, you know, you're a sea of faces and you're just looking to see how the residents are talking with each other. If they have like inside jokes and hanging out and stuff like that, and just enjoying just being together, even if it's virtually through the computer um, and just seeing those interactions virtually uh, was kind of helpful for me, but I don't know, Lika, if you want to comment and Dr. Farrick, if I answered your question, if not. Um, well, I, I was, yeah. as you were speaking, I was thinking maybe another way of looking at that since like our program didn't do that. I think one way to see that sort of interaction is during the interview, because mm -hmm. we had a resident room, the residents would interview and the attendings would interview. And then, so you'd have two different interviews. And so I think the things that you're saying about the interactions, you could pick up on in the resident room, how they were interacting with each other. Were they friendly? Was it more formal? That's the exact kind of stuff that I think you could pick up on in any event. Maybe it's just the interview for smaller programs that, that don't, or programs that don't host something like that. So um, I think, I think that's, I think what you said about just what to look for is the key versus how they deliver it. Yeah, I agree. And, you know, I got great feelings from programs who, um, if they were unable to have like the free interview dinner, um, during like the actual interview day, they had, you know, the resident room to actually be able to ask questions and stuff like that. Yeah. Dr. Fernandez, if you'd like to um, kind of give your spiel on that one important thing to take away, as well as maybe addressing how to answer those difficult questions, as well as our loved question of tell me about yourself. Uh, my one piece of advice was actually going to be about the tell me about yourself, because you're guaranteed to get it, um, if not from uh, one of them, maybe all of them. Like I had one interview where every single one asked me to tell me about myself. And essentially it's, I call it your elevator speech. Essentially it should be the length of an elevator ride uh, with somebody where you can tell them really quickly who you are and what it is about you that you want them to know and what you bring to the table. And I rehearsed that like in the shower while I was cooking, while I was taking the trash out, say it out loud. And I wound up saying it so much that it sounded rehearsed because I had practiced it so much. So I actually wound up putting ums and likes in there just like very strategically. Uh, but I had, it was every single interview asked me. So I just had to wind up. Um, and, you know, there's also the, there's the socials and the virtual residency fairs. I wound up having to say it really like a lot. So I wound up having to tailor it. Like I just came up with it from the spot, but I did not. And I, I think that when you're prepared to answer that question, it, because it's typically the first question that they ask, if you come out strong and confident, it's, it like makes you feel good about yourself just straight up because you did not stumble on your first question that they ask you. And, um, you just, you, you sound like, you know what you're talking about and you're confident. And that's really, you, it, I, I think it just like puts you in a good light. Uh, so I would say if you don't have your, tell me about yourself yet, uh, think about it, practice it. Let me know if you need help about what you're telling me about yourself should be. But mine was like really quickly, probably less than like 45 seconds, less than that probably, but um, it should be very quick. And then difficult questions. I really didn't have any difficult questions. Um, I'm not really sure why that is. I like to think it's because emergency medicine is the best specialty and no one's trying to trip you up. Um, uh, but I think the, the hardest, like, uh, I think it was Dr. Carrick that mentioned it, um, during one of the virtual residency fairs, I wasn't expecting to get a mini interview 
And I was so tripped up. I thought we were just going to have a conversation. And I was going to be like, hey, take a look at me. I have bad board scores, but I'm a great fit for your program. And he wound up interviewing me. Like it was like a mini interview where he asked me my strengths and my weaknesses and I just wasn't prepared. So I'm going to echo what Dr. Carrick said and just be prepared for any and all questions. Um, and like actually have a true weakness, like not a weakness that you just like, uh, you spin into a not weakness. <laughs> actually like do some thinking because, you know, Yes, a weakness is a weakness. It's like the, the negative connotation around that word, but being self-aware is very important. Being able to evaluate yourself and recognize like what you need working on, uh, I have found. Actually, that's a lot of the feedback that I'm getting this year as an intern. They're like, you recognize what you are weak on and you're not afraid to ask for help. So find a weakness uh, that you can be honest about. <laughs> And Sharon just asked, uh, did you take notes throughout your interview? Yes, I did. Uh, it was so, okay. If you see how I'm looking at you all right now, I have like Dr. Carrick in the middle of my screen, uh, like up top. And so I would have all of my interviewers on the top half of my screen so that if I was talking to Dr. Carrick, it looks like I'm looking at her eyes, but my video camera is right there. So I would have it set up to where it looked like I was looking straight in her eyes. And then off to the side, I would have my notepad like on my Mac and I would jot down quick notes. And in that same notepad, I would have my questions for each uh, program as well so, so that I don't have to like it's like very much off to the side so I, I don't miss a beat in the flow of the conversation uh, and then I would I wouldn't take notes like while they were while I was talking I would do it in between interviewers though I know that interviewers do take notes while we're talking but I just didn't want to be distracting you are so prepared and you and uh, both of you this setup is amazing I mean it, it wow Leanne and then uh, like uh, the fact that you have this planned out your look where to look where to put people on the screen your notes uh, this is wonderful I you guys have to be in the definite top 10 percent of anyone I've ever heard of interviewing. I don't think this is great advice for any students that are on here right now, because I can assure you most students are not doing this. So you will look like you are much ahead of the game uh, if you are doing these things. And we talked about this already a little bit, but uh, Princess and um, Another student actually asked, how do you stand out during these virtual interview seasons? Are there any ways to stand out as an IMG or DO applicant? I think um, Dr. Pierce touched on this a little bit with her question or her, uh, her uh, initial talking about, um, I don't know how, how you came into this, but somehow you, we, we got to talking about researching your program preparation. And um, I would say, and I typed this in the chat, but I would say, look, look up your program that you are going to interview with. What, what's their mission? What's their vision? Who are their faculty? Who, um, you know, who, how many residents they have. These are things that if you ask these things in the interview, like how big is the city of Norman? Excuse me, this is the stuff you don't want to do. Honey, three kids, three dogs, it's crazy. Um, so if you're asking things that you should see blatantly on a website for the program, then it is obvious you didn't take the time to look up that program and those 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 things that that are out there for the public. It's one thing to ask, what's the culture of your program? What's a typical, you know, things that you can't find from looking on the internet. But but I would do your research so that you 
are um, you're coming in and you can use things like the mission and the vision to ask deeper and more thoughtful questions. So like Dr. Pierce mentioned, you know, if she has a, a lot of underserved or a high population of some type of, of nationality or something like that, then then maybe you can use that to, to really um, ask thoughtful questions. And then they know that you looked at their vision. So you could say, I saw on, on you know, that your vision is to serve rural Kansas. And how do you all uh, ensure that you're doing that or something like that. So I would say you can, you can impress by doing research. Thank you. And our next question was and just, can I oh, throw yes, one thing in it. there about I, from the DO perspective of that question, I would just so highly encourage you to just be you and be confident and strong in who you are and don't try to be who you think an Ivy League white glove ivory tower place wants you to be. If you went to an osteopathic school and became a DO because you wanted to become a holistic uh, or a physician who thinks holistically and pays attention to treating the whole person. You know, you tell your interviewer that you are determined to become an emergency physician who yes, treats the urgent matter, but pays attention to treating the whole person and looking at, trying to look at if you can, the, you know, socioeconomic issues or the whatever issues. Talk about who you are, if that's who you are, and you're a DO because you chose to be a DO, that is something that many, many MDs um, wish they were and be confident in that. So don't feel like you have to be some uppity, stuffy researcher or you're not gonna be accepted. And that is, you know, if you're a researcher, great, you go, um, but just, just trust that who you are, you have something that's really unique and really important and sell that and be confident selling that. And don't forget to smile. It could, because although an interview is serious and you're nervous, remember that they chose you to be there because they are interested in you and you should take that in itself as confidence and as a compliment. And so, although you do want to be your best self, and I know that you're probably trying to think about what they're going to ask next. And as they're speaking, you're trying to think of your answer in your mind, but um, just, just smile. And it's okay when you get asked a question to take a moment and think before you speak. You don't have to start speaking or fill pauses with, um, let me think, or, you know, you don't have to make up filler. Just give yourself a few seconds to think about an answer while you're taking a breath and, and thinking about how you want to start the, the question and then move forward. But just remember, it is okay to just take a moment and gather your thoughts that you don't have to immediately, like any blank space is bad. That's not true. On the applicant side of it, I remember last year um, and just speaking with other people as well too. Um, it's hard when you go to a medical school in one region and you want to go to a completely different region and on your application, it doesn't show that you have any ties to that. I think something that helped me last year when I was applying was um, that I sent out letters of intent, not immediately, not right when ERS opened or interviews started going out, 
I think the like the first round that I sent were in November and it was just something to either the program director or the coordinator or whoever um, and just seeing why I was interested in their program um, and then what ties I had to that area. So if I was applying to Southeast programs, I have a sister that lives in Atlanta. And so I would say I have, you know, my sister that lives here with my nieces. I would love to be close to them. That way, you know, you they'll see it and it's not just immediately reject pile because they're like, why would they ever come here if their entire life was spent in the Midwest, you know? So I thought that was helpful. And I think that that put me on the radar for some programs that I wouldn't necessarily have heard from or gotten interviews from. Uh, and then also researching programs is incredibly important. If you do get a schedule of what your interview day looks like along with who you're interviewing with, I think it's good to look them up and see what their interests are that because that can also help personalize your questions to who you're interviewing with. And I like to I like to take notes as well too during the interview, uh, during the breaks after I interview with somebody just to write their name down and then also write something that we talked about. I sent thank you emails to most of the people that I interviewed with. I don't know how everyone else feels about it, but I just thought at the very minimum, they're taking the time out of their day to interview me. And so I just wanted to thank them for their time and the opportunity, but. Yeah, I and, sent, oh, go ahead. Oh, I, I sent thank you. I sent thank you notes to everybody except for the people who told me not to send thank you notes because there are some programs pay attention to if they tell you to not send thank you notes because I didn't realize how many emails we get until now I'm on this side of things. There are so many emails, my goodness, just like about how the hospital runs and also like clinical work and research opportunities. And it's like, I can't even imagine what doctors Carrick and Pierce's email, like mailboxes look like. Um, but don't say, don't send thank you notes if they say no need to send a thank you note. I endorse uh, thank you notes. I like to receive them, um, especially from somebody. I, I think you realize when you connect to somebody um, on an interview, if you haven't met them, I'm interviewing um, faculty right now for positions at my medical school. And there are some that I just click with through an interview. It's weird, but you do. And then I've gotten some very nice thank you emails, just short and sweet. It was great meeting you. And I thought, yeah, I feel the same. And, and I even will write back uh, carefully not to give any intent about any future plans, but but um, I think it's fine. And if you want to do that and, and you, you feel a connection, especially those people that you, you hit it off with in an interview, I think that's a, a nice little touch. All right, and again, um, before we keep going on, I just wanna encourage everyone to go ahead and submit questions. We have about 20 minutes left. And if there's something that we haven't answered yet, please just throw it in the chat box and we'll make sure we highlight it. The next question is from Kimberly from PCOM. She wants to know how to address potential red flags during an interview. And anyone can take this. I can, I'll take that. I think that you just attack them head on. I, the worst thing is to ignore them and to try to make them make it act as if it doesn't, it's not there. I think that when people do that, it feels fake and it feels like they're trying to cover something up. And like, if you, if it's not, if it's just like a mild thing, no big deal, don't worry about it you can be pretty much guaranteed when we invite you for an interview, I've seen your board scores. I've seen if you have a drunk driving arrest. I've seen if you failed a rotation and something about your application had me decide that I was interested in interviewing you. So probably a reasonable explanation for a board score or a failure or something like that is going to be something that I'm gonna to listen to and accept and just move on. Um, I would not, I would take the opportunity in the interview to 
address it. And, you know, there are certain things like if you took complex one and got a very low score and then on complex two got a great score, I look at that and I think complex one was a bad day because the test cannot, you can't trick the, tra the test. So the highest score you get on the test is how smart you are and that's all there is to it. And really we're mostly concerned about whether or not you can take a test because you have to pass boards. It doesn't define who you are, right? So that's, you know, don't feel like you have to go explain one bad test if you did fine on the other one. But if you failed a course or if you have an extra year of school, if I have somebody who's spent five years in med school and doesn't bring that up to tell me about it, I feel like they're not being really honest with me. So I, everybody I know, every program director I know, everybody hands down feels the same way that just be honest about it, tell me about it and move on. And it is, none of us are perfect. I challenge you to find one person who doesn't have something in their background that could be a red flag. And, um, you know, just own it and move on. And then also don't make excuses for it. So that would be the other thing that, that people who have an excuse for everything are not people that we generally want in, uh, in our residency. And I know that not many do. Um, so don't make excuses for everything, just own it and talk about how you're moving on from it. I agree with that too. And we had residents in our program that didn't pass one part of their boards or uh, had some, some reason they were behind. Um, one of my residents, her husband was deployed um, in the military. She was acting as a single mom. Her child got sick. She couldn't study for the boards. And I mean, they're that in itself, I thought, my gosh, you are doing all of that in medical school. I mean, we, we loved her. We applauded her that, that she was taking all that on. And then she, I think she brought it up in her initial, tell me about yourself question because um, she wanted to get it out there in the open. She talked about, you know, here's what brought me just to medical school. And then during medical school, this is what happened in my first year. And, and so she addressed it right away. It was kind of the elephant in the room for her. And, um, and I think it's a much better way of dealing with that than waiting for someone to, because for the interviewer, it's kind of a weird question, to be honest, to say, hmm, can you tell us, it's hard to ask this, but can you tell us what happened when you didn't pass step one? Or, you know, there's just no nice, fun way to ask that. It's just not the, it's not a fun question to have to ask people what happened here, what happened there. So um, if you do it for them um, in a way that explains what happened, honestly, I think it even takes the burden off of your interviewer a little bit, which is not a bad thing. But um, I agree totally with Dr. Pierce on that one. Just be honest, whatever happened, just say it and admit what happened. And we're all human and we know that. Thank you. And uh, Dr. Pierce and Dr. Carrick, uh, Taryn asked this question. How do we feel about sending letters of intent post-interview pre-match? Is that acceptable or frowned upon? Um, I think that communicating with the program director is always fine. Um, it may be difficult. I think that we all have different approaches to writing back. I'm really, really, a rule follower and I will not tell you where you stand. I'll, I'll make a comment like, oh, everybody here really enjoyed meeting you and thought you'd be a great fit or something like that. Something like if, if 
I guess if we liked you, if we didn't like you, I'll say something a little more neutral and try to be polite. But, um, but I will say something like that, but I would never ever say where you are on our match, are on our match list or that we're gonna rank you to match or anything like that, but that's illegal. We are not supposed to say that. So from our end, I won't say that, but if you, if you express, if you send an email to me that expresses major interest, you know, that probably is gonna unconsciously influence me. I mean, I, I have to be honest, I, to read a flattering email that says, we loved your place, I think you'd be the perfect place for me. Do I, am I suggesting you do that? No, that is completely not the design of the whole process. But to be honest with you, if I read an email like that, how am I not flattered, you know? And how am I not thinking that, wow, this is somebody who would be really enthusiastic to train here and that's who I want, right? So um, I think that communication is a good, is fine, especially later on in the interview process when, you know, people, when you interview with somebody in the beginning of November and it's all through January, people, you know, we figure people forget who we are, um, you know, it, it sometimes is a nice little reminder. Um, so I think it's fine to communicate. I wouldn't feel like you have to do that. And I would just be honest. I wouldn't feel like I would like had to shovel or kiss up to anybody or anything like that. Um, but it's okay to communicate with the program director. And it's the same concept. Like, um, I think who was it? Um, Angela, that was saying about if you're from far away, no, Alik, uh, I forget who Leanne, one of you guys was saying, if you're from, I just had this happen to me the other day. So a, a resident from Vermont, we're in Pennsylvania, a resident from Vermont sent me an email explaining to me why she wanted to be in Philadelphia. And that turns out that her primary family now lives down here, but I couldn't see that anywhere in her application. So she either needed to put that in a personal statement or I'm gonna say, why would somebody from Vermont move to Philadelphia? You know, so it's not gonna be the first person that I look at when you get a lot of applications. You know, we got like 1700 applications. It's not, you have to think, you have to break it down somewhere. So that I then went and looked at her application and, and she's somebody that I would love to potentially have in my program. So that email mattered to me and I know that, um, some program directors will tell you not to do that, but I think it is valuable if you're wanting to go from the East Coast to the West Coast and you have a reason to do that, explaining why um, might make a difference to get interviews. I would say it's, a, it's, I think it's good to tell people while you're rotating or while you're interviewing that I want to come to your program I, in, if you're going to rank them, number one, and, and you want to be honest to that program, go for it. But we have had people lie to us. And so if you're, and that's just a bad reflection on, on, I mean, I know people probably end up changing their minds maybe, but unless you're really sure and you're not going to change your mind, I wouldn't say you're going to rank that program. Um, unless you really are, because um, it is a relatively small world and you will see all these people, you may see all these people at conferences or on things like this or um, just later on. And then to me, I, I tend to remember things like that. And I still remember people that said things like that. And then they're at another program and they're and my residents are the same way. And we have, we always remember people as, oh, remember her? She's the one we really wanted. And she said she was going to come here. And then she, she chose another program down the street, you know, and which is silly, but, but it happens. So if you're going to take the time to send a message like that, I would just be sure that that's, that's true. Um, and I agree with Dr. Pierce about sending a message later on, maybe a couple of months down the road after you've done some rotations and say, I've done other rotations. I've thought about this. 
Um, I've done other, or I've done other interviews and I still really want to come to your program. That's great. But please don't send emails every other week and say, remember me, I still want to come to your program. And I, 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 I just want you to know you're my top choice and that that's too much. And then that you become kind of like a stalker. Um, so please don't do that because it, it's not a good look and you will not get a vote. <laughs> and I see a question about um, illegal questions. And you should know people cannot ask you about a lot of things. They cannot ask you if you're married. Sometimes these things just slip out because it's almost natural conversation. It's not malicious, but it's almost, oh, I have kids, you have kids, but you're not supposed to ask that. Are you married? I'm married. What do you like to do? You like to go, you know, see, you have family here. You're not really supposed to ask about family. You're not supposed to ask about, you know, sexual preferences or, or anything like that. So if you get asked a question that you're not comfortable with, I mean, honestly, you can always say, I don't feel comfortable answering that, or, you know, I'd rather not answer that, but I'm happy to, um, to talk about if you have another question for me, I'd be happy to, you know, I don't know the best way to, you can say, with without any problem that you know or you can even blame it on your 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 program or something or this this series and say oh i was told i wasn't supposed to answer questions about about family or about my, my like you know if i was married or not or pregnancy that's a big one especially for females about you know are you planning to have a family no, 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 no. That's a big one. So just say, you can always say, I'm not sure. I, I don't know. I, have, I haven't decided. That's a good one. I haven't decided about that yet. But I would just, just don't feel obligated to, for any of that type of stuff. Yeah, I agree. And the one, there are people, there are a lot of people actually that put in their hobbies, um, their kids, or their dog or whatever. And I think if you put things about, you know, um, somebody put hanging, what was it? Something with their twin that they love to do. It was very unique. And I asked them about it and, but they put it there deliberately to be asked about. Like you can tell when you put something so unique in your, in your hobbies and stuff that you're just waiting to see if, I read your CV to find the unique thing and ask about it. But the, um, so I think that if you put it out there, that it's probably fair game to ask, but not past a line. Like if somebody puts out that their favorite thing to do is go, you know, hiking with their two dogs and their two kids and I don't know, whatever, but you know, you, you, I'm not going to ask if you're going to have more kids or if you're going to have whatever you just don't you can just just either be silent because I can guarantee to you that interviewer knows they shouldn't be asking that question and that would just be like them looking in the mirror and that can say all the words you would ever say or you just say you know I I'm not sure yet or just something totally vague um because most people aren't really comfortable saying I am not comfortable answering that question. So just make it a, a, I'm not sure. I don't know the answer to that question or something like that. Yeah, I would say I'm not sure. I haven't decided yet. That's yeah. a good one. And Nantha, can I, there was the first question on the list that I actually have. A, can I just answer this question real quick? Yes, which, <laughs> what's the question? So, so Aram, if I'm saying that right, I don't know if I'm saying that right, says, how do you answer a question about comparing rotation sites? So interestingly, let me give you a perspective on that because you may not realize the way that I think about that question. So I actually ask that question commonly, but I ask it from a perspective of, think about the 
now I'm going to give away one of my questions. I probably shouldn't do this, but um, but think about the different rotation sites. So it's like perfect if you rotated in an inner city, busy level one trauma center and a community hospital. Be that's that's just perfect. So tell me what you really liked about each place or what you found made you tick about one place versus the other. And what I'm getting at in that question is what would you want to have in your residency program? Like what about the places did you like that makes me understand that you liked um, having never knowing what was coming through the doors and having it be total chaos or you liked sitting around sipping tea for a half an hour talking about the latest new england journal article like you you're going to tell me what i'm going to read through the lines and figure out what kind of residency program might be right for you and whether we're right for you and that's where i'm going with that question so it's not i don't want to hear like i don't we know all these programs usually, a lot of them. And I don't need to hear all the negative things. Nobody wants to hear all the bad things about Einstein. They want to hear what you what you liked about Einstein and might be something that you would like to have in your residency program. Thank you, Dr. Pierce. Uh, quick recap, uh, Sharon had asked, what do you receive, or when did you receive the majority of your interviews? Uh, Leanne and Alika have been answering in the chat box as well, but they both said that um, they uh, heard their programs in waves and heard back from everyone by the second week of December. And let's see, we talked about the tips on how to sidestep uh, questions that are illegal. Um, I believe that they're answering Timothy's question now, but Dr. Carrick and Dr. Pierce, if you have any suggestions about personally debriefing your interview after the day's over, any kind of notes from earlier interviews that were particularly helpful when making rank list decisions from your end. If you um, think of anything that a interviewee should consider, please feel free to also answer in the chat box. I have one more question that I did want to ask you all before our time's up. We have about two minutes, but Kirsty um, from Western University asked, how do you ask questions that will help you decide whether a community versus academic versus county program fits you best? Um, especially if you still haven't 100% figured this out. I think it's a strong question that I think everyone here could benefit from. That's like the hardest um, question. Oh, go ahead. Uh, you guys tell your perspective and then I'll tell mine from this end. I knew uh, exactly like what, I not exactly, but I, I had a feeling of what I wanted like my career trajectory would be like I knew and I knew what brought me fulfillment so I knew that I wanted to be at a county program just straight up because uh that was all I, I worked with that population my whole life I worked at free clinics like since I was 18 so I wanted to work with that population I wanted to be in the safety net taking care of like people who need it most and so I knew that I wanted to do county, but there's not a whole lot of county programs. Um, and I didn't think I was competitive for them. So then I also kind of juggled um, taking a look at programs that had a mix of like community and academic as well. And then prioritizing where, like what I was most interested in based on that. Because also at the end of the day, I wanna work with that population, but I also want to teach, whether it's residents, but really I like gravitate towards medical students. So I also knew that I wanted that side of things. So it's really just think about what your overall goals are and then see how that pans out. I don't know if that's the best advice, but that's how I approached it as an applicant. I think for me too, because it's kind of hard to know, like if you haven't rotated at like academic sites versus uh, more community sites and county sites too. Um, on the, like for academic and community, I just felt like it was, I think academic, it's more consult heavy and community you do more um, and get to do a lot more procedures, but then you don't necessarily see like the super, super sick, complicated patients that normally get transferred to higher levels of care, like academic. But 
that was kind of like what I kind of went for. Um, I don't know if I'm the best for answering it because UIC kind of uh, will rotate at different sites, community and academic, but just again, like whatever, you know, you guys like want to do for your career trajectory, like Alika mentioned. to think about what you like, first of all, what, what you think is fun. You know, do you think that trauma is fun? Do you think that taking care of peds is fun? Are you, do you imagine that you're going to be the kind of person like most are that's going to be scared to death when you get your first sick kid? Um, you know, things like that. And then look at what population of those patients you would get at different programs. So if you hate trauma, you'll take ATLS, you'll be adequately prepared in trauma, but you could, you know, you might not want to work at a level one trauma center that sees a ton of gunshot wounds. Um, if you are scared of trauma, you might want to work at a level one trauma center that sees a ton of trauma, make sure that you're good with it and then go work in the community. So when you see that once in a blue moon gunshot wound, you can, you can handle it. Um, if you love kids, you wanna work at a place where you're gonna see a fair amount of kids. Um, you might not wanna work at a place where they have a pediatric ED right next door. And the only time you see kids is when you rotate in that pediatric ED. You might wanna work at a place where you see kids as part of your practice all day, every day. Um, you know, things like that. If you, when you look at different programs, try to identify, figure out what features are important to you. And then I, I would make a list of all those, you know, bring out your Excel spreadsheet, start with, okay, I think these five or 10 things are what are, what's going to be important to me. And then go to your first interview, then look at that list and say, okay, what boxes did they check? Oh, you know what? I thought it was pretty cool that they are a pediatric receiving hospital and they see a lot of kids, um, maybe I'll add that to my list. And then, you know, they have a really good cafeteria. I'm gonna add that to my list. Um, whatever you do, so figure out when you go to interviews, what becomes important to you and then reprioritize and reorder your list. And that'll help you to figure out one, how to do your rank list at the end. You can see where things land and who has the most check boxes and then kind of start to do things that way but it'll also help you to figure out what's important to you because you'll find that you keep putting the important things up at the top of your list. And then you'll realize, you know what? I, that is important to me. I didn't even realize how important it is for me to have a lot of kids or to have this or to have that. Um, you know, if you want to do some kind of, I don't know, uh, if you want to do ultrasound, a ton of ultrasound stuff, you want to make sure that there's enough ultrasound credentialed faculty on staff at a particular program. So um, I think that that when it comes to county academia, there's different types of academia. In Philadelphia, we have Einstein and Temple, which are lower socioeconomic, busy level one trauma centers, and the antithesis of us is Penn, which is a mega, you know, trauma or a mega academic center, but it is a white glove ivory tower institution. It We are gritty, get your hands dirty, and we are both high level academic institutions. So there's all sorts of different academia. There's all sorts of different community. You know, you have to, to figure out what aspects are important and also, really the patients that you're taking care of and whether you want to take care of that kind of patient. I, not everybody wants to take care of underserved patients. Not everybody. I worked in the community at a very affluent hospital for a couple of years. I could not stand it because I don't do well with entitled. So think about yourself, think about your personality and what kind of people do you want to, to take care of and to manage as the patients you're going to learn from for the next three or four years. And I, I think I would try to make your um, decisions based on that. And then the other decision is, are you the kind of person that wants to work at a very constant high paced place? Or are you the kind of person that would rather have a little bit of a slower pace and some time to you know sit around and think about things and stuff like that? Or do you want the kind of place that, you know, if 
five gunshot wounds come through the door and by within five minutes and that kind of adrenaline some people get love that adrenaline some people hate that adrenaline like those are the kind of ways that I don't think it's black and white you know big academic and community there's a lot of nuances in both areas I know I just made that question completely mucky didn't help to clarify it at all probably but um but I think that it's there's a lot to think about there Thank you, Dr. Pierce. And with that, unfortunately, our hour is up. I know we ran about five minutes over, but we were having a great conversation. Um, everyone, please join me in thanking Dr. Pierce, Carrick Fernandez, and Shalabi for sharing with us tonight. Um, thank you, everyone, for attending this session tonight. Um, we're always interested in your feedback, so please let us know what you thought about tonight's program by returning the survey that I just posted in the chat box. If you don't like filling out surveys, then feel free to DM me on Twitter and tell me what you want. The, these sessions are specifically for all of you, so if we're not doing something correctly, if we can um, better use of this hour, please let us know. We're open to suggestions, and please, please join us for our next Women in Emergency Medicine session on November 16th. It's gonna be about how to network effectively on rotations and obtaining that strong letter of recommendation. Uh, to register for our upcoming sessions, visit the AEM Women in EM website and select the appropriate links. Again, thank you for joining us. We look forward to seeing you again. And this now ends tonight's program. I know we still got some chats going and uh, I believe that our panelists are also putting down their email addresses. So feel free to reach out to them as well. And I am just going to formally uh, stop the recording now. Thank you all.